they came in the middle of the night and essentially kidnapped him and left police officer and, and two social work. I mean, it was, it was insane. It felt like living in a nightmare. Tandy, I'm very happy to have you on the show. Mm, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. So you are a soul sister who started a wellness um, enterprise. You're the engine behind Unicorn Wellness, but you also have a lot of other interests. Today, I want to talk about um, your personal journey, some of the, the traumas or difficulties, hardships, how you overcame those um, for inspiration for people listening and who are maybe starting on their journey or maybe feeling stuck in their own. And I also want to talk about what's happening in our collective consciousness. Um, I feel a great shift coming um, in the couple next couple of months and forward. So uh, Tandy is not just a yoga teacher, fitness instructor, wellness advisor. She's also very much into tarot and her own spiritual connectivities. And so she has a lot of different perspectives to offer. So anyway, let's dive right in. So you own Unicorn Wellness, which is based in Brooklyn, but you have a lot of online offerings as well. So people can join you from all over the place, correct? Unicorn Wellness Studio is only an online offering. We've been online since 2013. So yeah. oh, okay, super. Yeah. And what brought you to your opening of Unicorn Wellness? What was the need that you were seeing in the... The need for an online offering met a couple of needs. I was in a high-end facility with celebrity clients and kind of that space and place. And it was wonderful for the period of time that I was there. I learned a lot, taught me a lot, met incredible souls. Um, but I was transitioning to being a mother of two instead of a mother of one. And there were two sides to the coin. I wanted to be home as much as possible with my babies and really be in that place and space and those early years and time. Um, but I was also seeing so many pieces and places where wellness and fitness was inaccessible because of the price point and a just entirely elitist space. And I was honored to be in that space, um, but really felt like so much of the marketing of fitness and wellness is a big old lie, right? Based in fear, keeping us in doubt and disempowered and therefore continually spending and seeing people and meeting people and talking to people looking for genuine change, wanting to root in something a little bit um, more real and just really reconnect or connect to themselves for the first time. And it was an idea that was birthed really by my business partner and husband, my life partner. And he was like, why don't we do this online? And it was when it was really not cool. Right. So it was yeah. this like super weirdo Aquarian, like I'm going to leave this career that others aspire to have and give it a go to try to make um, more connections with more people and to make something really genuinely accessible and actionable for them. Yeah, that's super. I, I can relate in several ways. I remember when I first uh, started working in the health food store, uh, 1994, I think it was. And at that time, although there was quite a, a number of people interested, you know, it was kind of the rebirth, if you will, of organics and supplements and so forth. It was so expensive and there was only a certain kind of person who could afford yeah. the access to organic food and to supplements and so forth. Um, and of course that was a long time ago. We've come a long way, but I think there's still in the mass population, a perception of I want to, but I can't, or I can't afford X, Y, or Z and resources like your own. And also just the demand, the more we demand, you know, organic food, the more we demand um, places and situations where we can practice and our yoga our meditation, our healing work, I think it helps to bring it more available. So I thank you for that, for sure, yeah. because I totally it's one of my pet peeves. And, you know, for myself, I've tried to keep prices as low as possible. And I see people now coming up and, you know, they're healers and they're, they're doing the chakra balancing and so forth. And they're charging hundreds of dollars for yeah. a session. And it kind of breaks my heart. And then I'm also positioned with, oh my gosh, what do I do? Because there's also a mentality of, well, if it doesn't cost a fortune, it may not be as good as somebody I've else find myself continually in that space. So the yeah. space that I came from that I left was that, you know, clients couldn't, did not have access to me unless they were willing or capable of paying a hundred to $350 an hour. And this is the way back machine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 
I was in a place in a space of being a professional and at a mastery level in the professional industry there, living in a city that was really, you know, expensive. expensive. I was in, in LA at the time and in Brooklyn now, it's not any different. I couldn't afford to take classes with people that I wanted to take classes with. Yeah. And, you know, to be clear, I'm, I teach Pilates. There are yogic influences in what I teach, but I'm really, it's based in Pilates. And mm-hmm. that for forever at a studio level has been highly elitist. And just as in all education, the more education an instructor has, the more elite it becomes to get access to them. Right. And, and the internet solves quite a bit of that. It also makes it noisy, makes it hard for genuine you know, masters and, right. and teachers with a lot of experience to stand out because everybody claiming to be a master at yeah. something I when know. they're not, you yeah. know? So there's this spectrum of it for sure. Yeah. as well. that It's really just about like connecting, making a difference and the price points of it. I still find that for me as well as a coach and a mentor that I want it to keep it accessible. Mm-hmm. It also requires an investment that's sometimes slightly uncomfortable so that we really energetically invest in the yeah. process of it. Yeah. And so on that topic, just as a reminder to people, you know, so many people are looking for support and for their teacher and their leader. And I continually tell people, you know, you have to sniff out a lot of different types and a lot of different people and go with what feels right for you versus what other people are saying, or what's the most popular in your area right now and see what resonates. So I want to talk about your your personal journey, you know, what's gone on in your life as far as some of the difficulties that you've had to overcome, whether it be, and I don't know the answer to this, so you can inform us whether it be addictions, relationship issues, abuse, trauma, what have you, what, what's been part of your life that has colored and influenced your desire for wholeness and healing? There's been a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, with my work with clients and my audience, I, try, you know, to move us away from, you know, kind of the trauma Olympics, like my list is longer, bigger than yours, but, (laughs) but the list of mine has been fairly extensive and, um, we'll touch on them today and there might not be enough space for some of them. Also, the first is that, you know, I was adopted and this can be very, um, spiritually whitewashed if people aren't really have had an experience with it, that, that sense of unworthiness, you know, of not belonging of that. It's a primal wound of like the, the puppy being thrown out of the litter. Um, and as I grew up, I didn't totally understand that. I didn't even register that until I became pregnant with my first son. And it, really cracked open. All of the pieces were there. Those who are adoptees tend to take two paths, either they're, you know, hyper achievers because I will be so worthy. You cannot get rid of me. Right. Right. I will earn. That was my path for sure. Um, and the other path tends to be that of addiction and unworthiness and just self-sabotage self-sabotaging and sinking into that place. Um, I was adopted by a family that um, had substantial resources in that day and age. When I was eight, my father was indicted and went to federal prison when I was 13. Um, So I lived through a very public shaming of our family in the newspapers, um, the local news, going from a lifestyle of private schools and you know, just very different to public schools. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but in those ages and stages, it was completely a different, I felt like an alien everywhere I was. And I was a child in that scenario. I had no idea what was going on. I was completely being judged on the decisions of my father and my family. Um, And, you know, coming back as an adult and as a parent, and you're like, no one talked to me about it. It was like they were too busy and in too much trauma themselves to, to guide and to protect. Um, you know, layer in, I have a, I had a mother, an adoptive mother who was highly abusive, physically abusive, um, verbally, emotionally, and sexually. Mm-hmm. And so it was just layer upon layer of survival, right? Of just always putting on a good face if you're, if you're pretty and shiny, I mean, I'm from the South, you know, if you're female in a certain vessel, 
it's fine then because it shows up fine. Right. Right. And there were so many people in my life that knew about the abuse. Um, but be, for all the reasons, nobody stepped in, right? It was, there was money, there was power. You just, my mother was a, I, looking back, I mean, complete forgiveness, earnestly. I really believe that she was bipolar and needed help and support. And everyone chalked it up to emotional, crazy female. Right. And I think she really struggled with trying to be heard and trying to be seen and just couldn't regulate, yeah. you know, right. because she was either just really interesting, very present or just hyper abusive and terrifying. And you never knew which you were getting. Yeah. Yeah. At those places. Um, so what was it? Uh, what, at what point did you recognize your um, struggle with the abuse and the shaming and the feeling unwanted. Do you have a recollection of when that awareness came to you? I don't think there was one moment. I think there were many moments and I have a strange, um, there wasn't an aha, there wasn't a breakdown. I always had my eye and my focus on leaving for college. I felt like that was my out to leave home. Mm -hmm. um, and independence and that I'd figure it out when I left as far as like that moment of awareness, I actually feel hyper aware. I I've always felt hyper aware. And I think this is where the spirituality comes in is that I really always heard voices or felt something guiding me like a very close connection to guardian angels and archangel that I actually strangely feel very clear at a very young age that this was not someone like as far as my mother that was really in control of what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's been a learning curve and I continue to learn past it and through it as to where those chinks in the armor, where that subconscious programming brews itself. Yes. Um, the other big major piece of of process and shadow for me is that my oldest son, when, after he was born, he had, um, his birth, I, I guess a defining moment could be that pregnancy and that birth and his birth experience, because that's when it started to brew the pieces of, I was terrified to have him in a hospital. I thought he'd be taken away from me. Wow. Um, I started to remember things of my birth mother on that cellular level memory, it was a real cracking open of my intuition and psychic channel. It's always been there, right. but that was really the, if there was a defining moment, that was it, mm. but it wasn't so much an opportunity to work or to heal myself because everything started moving so quickly. And if you prescribe to a Saturn return, mine was pretty epic. Um, I gave birth to him and everything seemed fine. Three months later, we ended up in the ER and didn't leave for two months. So he had swelling in his head. He had internal, a, a small internal brain bleed. And it was just like, you know, the snowball that just gained momentum and took everybody down with them. Um, we were originally told that you know, he had this rare genetic disorder and, and disease and would never live past the age of 21 and wouldn't develop normally. Mm. And it just set off, like you wouldn't talk about like the weird triggers, yeah. you know, me trying to get information on my biological background that might help and assist him discovering my birth mother's name and the process of it. You know, people start adding things of like what was going on in, in my birthing process and my adoption that I'd never known before that all shakes out to people were being highly inflammatory in the situation. It wasn't as drastic as they thought it was. They were medically incorrect, but it started to snowball into a, um, legal issue of trying, you know, of, of claiming that there was child abuse within this because of the brain bleeds. Oh, wow. And so, he, you know, my son was getting better and better. We were in complete shock and trauma at every turn of it. And 
his medical diagnosis was also not that it, it was not that the brain bleeds were different than they would. The presentations were, were different than if it would have been abuse of any kind. He had been at daycare for a period of time. It was so chaotic and so epic. Mm. And it did continue in a legal issue, had to go to the state abuse specialist. And she basically came back and was like, what are you all even wasting my time and talking about it's this like classic thing that happens. There's a leap in head growth at three months. The brain can't catch up to it. The fluid pools, it pulls on the, you know. And so we, we'd been to court. They removed him from our home from a period of time. We didn't have warning. They came in the middle of the night and essentially kidnapped him and left. You know, I mean, it was Gosh. a police officer and, and two social work. I mean, it was, it was insane. It felt like living in a nightmare. Yeah. And like the police officer doubled back and he gave us his card and he goes, I have no idea what's going on here. Like he was like this, but if you need help, if you need a, a point person, like he knew there was something not right about what was going on. And I'm not giving all the full details because it is yeah. so much, Yeah. but that experience, I think if there's ever a moment of like when all shit hits the fan and you feel like you're living in a nightmare and you think everybody's crazy and everybody's just wrong at every turn. And it's like, where are the grownups? Where are the facts? Like what is happening here? Yeah. That you, you, you find spirituality real quick, you know, like it really was a place of feeling out of control, um, really insane. And doing all the practical pieces of hiring an attorney of, you know, contacting all of the doctors and recruiting all the help, but also heading towards lighting candles, setting intentions, making your wishes and saying prayers and starting making, you know, deals about how this is going to go. Because my partner and I both knew that it was not the truth. You know, they separated us. They tried to get us to say that the other person had done it and it was ugly. Yeah. And that was the deepest point of having to find some other anchor. Yes. He's 14, closer to 15 now. Um, and super healthy and, you know, just a delight. But it, it really was about feeling safe in the universe, who your advocates are, mm -hmm. how truth is perceived, how a story can just run away with like, experts in the room that were just, it was just a mess. Yeah. So that was really like, I felt like in my life, I already gone through so many traumatic pieces. I thought there couldn't be anything worse. And then there was, mm. and then we're just trying to survive and get past it and then kind of pretend like it didn't happen, you know, to live, to, to yeah. function. Right. And then it'll sneak up on you, right? I mean, this is how healing and grief and mourning and loss works. And because ugly stories that are hard to deal with, nobody wants to talk about them. So even our own family doesn't want to revisit it. They just want to keep going. And so if you're not willing to do that work, it'll take you down. I don't know other couples who would have survived it. And I just realized that was the place, you know, to go further into authenticity, connection to something bigger than yourself, to know your true path, to know your own authenticity, to really like when everybody else in the room is making you literally feel like you're crazy. Yeah. You know, I'd had a lifetime of practice. I felt in that already. And this seriously put it to the test of not leaning into them, you know, getting you to believe that it was something or someone that it wasn't. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing your story. And I know a lot of people can relate, maybe not with the exact same kind of circumstances, but you know, the ongoing traumas that replicate and mirror back to us with sometimes tragedies or you know, really impactful events, um, such as your son's health issues and the what followed after that, it can be disrupt is not even the word. Um, you know, it, it will crack a person open. And I I think. Two, something you mentioned about having those anchors in place and from an early early time being aware of connection to guardian angels and something greater than yourself is so critical. And I can claim that for myself too. I 
in those terrible times, fearful times, lonely times, confused times, um, traumatic times, it saved me. And I know that you and I aren't the only ones, you know, there's a lot of people, especially young people that can call upon that. And I, and I hope that more and more parents are encouraging some kind of, um, awareness and availability to types, different types of spirituality so that people can start to create their anchors in a more self-sufficient way, no matter what age, you know, no matter what age, the younger, the better. So that when we come into these times, they're totally closer to spirit than we are. Right. And so they get it off the bat if it's offered to them. And I do think that that was a huge part of, of my peace and safety in things was that I actually had a grandmother who was very connected. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up very religious and she was very religious, but looking back on the lens, she was like super woo -woo and spiritual, right? She had a deep connection and relationship to the, her guardian angels, to the archangels. She woke up every morning and wrote in a dream journal. Like she was very much, you know, would tell me about her dreams and then warn me about things and, and, it, it, it wasn't so much a teaching mechanism, right? Like modeled behavior is one of the strongest pieces. And I think because she had this lovely faith and connection, but it, it wasn't rooted in dogma. It was in what was coming through her mm -hmm. that, that did open that space for me as a child and yeah. why I wanted to stay home with my kids and you still do. I mean, we are currently homeschooling because the next generation is so important that they develop without so much noise of the culture, right? You know, that my practices may not be theirs, but they're offered options and they can test them and they can see what fits for them, but they will know what to go back to when shit falls apart. Cause being a human, it's going to fall apart. Right. It's going you know? to, yes. I love to hear that about your grandmother and mine too. I had two grandmothers. They were both very religious and very prayerful and, you know, music oriented. And I think for myself as well, that that was a, a role model to see, you know, yeah. the connectivity of faith and, and persistence and going to a place that is different than where people go out in the world to try to seek help. Absolutely. I, you know, my grandmother, again, there were some interesting pieces. They practiced Seventh-day Adventism, which was weird. It still seems off. You know, when I was growing up, they really, it was like, is it a cult? <laughs> it's like, no, it's Christian based, but it, it functions more like Judaism in a lot of ways. And she was very devoted to her morning readings and a great, you know, follower of Ellen G. White. And Ellen G. White was this fascinating person too. Like she was like a female presence and writer who still attributed to writing. I think she's the most prolific female writer of our time. And most people don't even know who she is just by sheer volume. Mm. So there were these places and spaces of like journaling, writing and connecting and calm and quiet in the morning. And everybody knew not to, you know, call or go by my grandmother's house until 11 because she would do her morning prayers, her morning reading and her morning journaling. Yeah, It was just like, she's not available. And my life is very much that too, you know? And so there's these, we can evolve and we can heal and, but there's still a through line of, of tradition and legacy and, and lineage in it that is very sweet yeah. with all the mess of, of it. Yeah. That's beautiful. So let's talk about what we can all expect um, coming forward. I have been talking a lot of my podcast and my online teachings and so forth about the sense of expanded consciousness, you know, on social media and all over the airwaves, people are talking about the new 5D reality and 5D consciousness. And, but just to not have necessarily that conversation, but what people can expect in their own, um, well, in their own day-to-day -day life, you know, of this new Aquarius age, this new um, expansive availability of consciousness, um, the struggle between power and people, you know, there's so many things going on in our world right now and in the airwaves, if you will. And so I just want to talk to you about what you think is happening, um, you know, and for 2022, at least, what do you think is coming down the pipeline? I think that 
we're just so much closer to energetics. I, I think that that veil is so thin and non-existent every day that the capacity to manifest and the capacity to heal is just quickening. And that pace is so fast, like Aquarian energy, that air quality energy running through a human vessel feels like, um, it, it generates anxiety because mm -hmm. it feels almost electrical in it's current. Cause it's so fast. I and think so, it was like a wind tunnel, like, you know, like yes. spirit wind flowing through a tunnel it's, and it's and every Aquarius season. I'm like, Oh, y'all, I gotta, I can't human so much right now. And it, and it requires for me even more grounding to, to anchor it. And so grounding, I'm very practical in my application. So this conversation, you know, will take a different space and, and turn than other people. But I think our capacity to ground needs to like triple up in order for us to be able to channel, harness, ground it and root it. Because my belief pattern is that as a human, right, we are here food, water, shelter, skin, and bone. We're here for a reason, but that the, the main goal is to balance our humanity and our divinity, to remember how divine we are, but we are here for a reason. We can't skip the human part. There are things to be done. There are things to heal. There are things to change and things to evolve. Right. So I really feel that 2022 is this precipice of the transition into like the quickening of things, but what we'll witness is more polarity, right? We have the, the Pluto return. So the sides start to get like even bigger, and so for me, it is about the day-to-day. -day. I feel like I work in the weeds, right? Taurus sun, it has to hit the concrete, like yeah. the most human of the signs. Like if it doesn't make a difference in my life, what point is there in it? Mm -hmm. And I think that the capacity to ground, because we have to remember that manifesting things means if our focus is on the negative, well, that negative stuff is going to come rushing in super fast. Right. So I think the capacity for healing, abundance, joy, this forward propulsion to better places and spaces as a collective is huge. But if you're not on the wagon of a self practice of being really diligent about grounding and connecting of honoring that we are balancing humanity and divinity, we're not just human. We're not just divine. Mm -hmm. Right then it's going to be a hot mess. It's going to get messier. Yeah. And so I think we are going to be in witness of two sides of humanity of like the mess getting messier and then others just manifesting and healing. Like what the hell is happening over there mm -hmm. in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And the phrase that's been coming through for a long time prior to the pandemic, but really started to be like the channeled message that wants to move through me is that the lessons of the collective are not always the lessons of the individual and that we can't get lost in the external, right? Like we need to be really close, like focused and to ourselves and close to our soul. What do we want? What is our goal? What works for us? Keep your eyes on your own lane and your own paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all good insight. I feel very similarly. And, you know, I had an experience come the turn of this year. Um, it started, I remember December 6th was a monumental day energetically for me when I just had a new oh, awareness. And then when the year turned, you know, it wasn't about um, setting goals or resolutions or anything, but I would say by and large day to day in my own life, certainly as uh, in the work that I do as a healer and so forth, but in my personal, in my personal life, I would fit, you know, have time for the, the exercising and the yoga and the eating. Okay. But I was still, you know, taking the times off and saying, I'll do that tomorrow. Or, you know, the half a package of cookies won't hurt that bad. You know, all of that was going on, but come the turn of the year, I felt this surge of, the time is now and almost like a regimentedness that needs to come with my daily practice. I cannot go, even if I'm exhausted, I have to do my rituals. I have to do my practice. I'm a yoga person. Um, I've never done Pilates actually. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you know, I, I have to do those things where I don't feel even complete for the day. And it's a very grounding way for me to feel anchored and my diet is cleaned up. You know, I don't even crave and that might come back around, but you know, I don't crave the half a package of cookies like I was because my focus is on, this is the path for me to vibrate higher, to feel better, to be more in alignment. And the craving for that is so strong that it literally brings me to tears. Sometimes I just am so in it, you know, and yeah. 
And I just want to say that because some people may be feeling that and be resisting against that because their own uh, stories and their own patterns and addictions and so forth. And I totally get it. And, and we don't have to be perfect human beings. You know, you said it so perfectly. We are human. We're not, yeah. we're not full spirit here and whoops, we're learning so much and we're here to do something. So so anyway, I well, just wanted and to And we're say, here to make mistakes. That's the point. It's the gauntlet. Right. Like we're here to it be messy. And yeah. so this is huge. I actually feel the same way. I used to be able to take a day off of meditation. You know, like I'm going to sleep in. We're doing family stuff. It's okay. I took two days off this weekend. I was like, that cannot happen again. That yeah. cannot happen again. It's not going to work. The frequencies coming through are bigger, right? our, our connection to each other is getting louder, mm -hmm. you know, that refining space. Um, I try to post a ton in my own personal process. When I take time off the mat now, it's just worse. It's just worse energetically because I look at the practices that I teach that I've been teaching for 23 years. It is about the vessel. It is about the soul. It is about the energetics. And if we're going to show up and be of service and make any constructive collective changes, we have to do it with ourselves first, right? We can think that it's indulgent and, and elitist to have these practices in place to clean up our foods, to be you know so bound to our meditation and our movement patterns. But this is the work, right? Nothing changes if we don't change. And the work of the individual is reflected in the collective. That, that personal activism and advocacy of change and healing, it literally starts here with yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and people just, we've just gone so far into marketing and had so many generations of fear. Uh, you know, I mean, we know what the U.S. Is, is built on and the dismantling of that is terrifying to people and it feels terrifying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the empowerment, getting closer to self, closer to spirit, it, I understand the juxtaposition, you know, of people who are not deeply in a spiritual world or in their woo-woo practices or in the magic. It sounds crazy, but yeah. the, the more committed you are to refining your own rhythms, yeah. it, the outside gets a whole lot less noisy. Yes. I know. And I'm, you know, I could talk about this for days yeah. on end because one of my pet peeves in particular is people on the woo-woo path. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people look at me and go, oh, she's on a woo-woo path. And, she, and I have been for 30 years. Okay. But in the same token, my number one focus is groundedness, practicality, feeling with my senses, you know, taking care of the, the physical body, knowing that for me to have more connection to my guys, for me to have more intuition, for me to have more capacity to dive deeper into my own healing work, I have to be embodied. And yes. so many of the people on the woo-woo path and the magic this, magic that, you know, the words are cute and it's all fine to practice whatever you want to practice, but it has to, it has to be grounded and embodied within to, to anchor us and to actually have any real merit, you know, we can all just talk about crystals and energy, but you know, talk about it. Okay. Or do you want to live it? You know, that's Compl a I could not agree more. Right. Yeah. Because it even like, even just the, the crystals, right. Yeah. You don't need all of those things. We can invoke them. We can, I do at times we can recruit them as helpers, but we are a spiritual being having a physical experience, this physical body, this vessel, this is the temple. This is heaven on earth. This is home of our soul. You want to get really magical. You want to heal, go home Tune that to thing the out. body. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so like, this idea of like how to, how to work with it, how to listen to it, how to respect it. It gets so convoluted. And even in what I teach and what I've, you know, it's been this like weird dialogue for forever of like, oh, it's fitness. And then uh, sure it can be absolutely, but I'm living with one foot in the 3d and one foot in the divine. Mm -hmm. So you can do these practical tactics. Yes. You will get practical 3d outcomes. Great. But the more you practice certain resonance, you get all of the divine resonance and spiritual lifting also, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so they, they work in community. You know, if you think about the infinity symbol, to me, that's the balance of humanity and divinity. You're going to mm -hmm. be souping and circling to and through these things, but they contribute one to the other. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I get so excited because I go, oh, I do this. This is what I teach. This is what I've always done. Yeah. Like the vessel is so powerful. 
And I really believe that if you're not tending to the vessel of the body, you're not tending to your magic, your spirituality, your manifestation. Mm -hmm. And the reason it might be a good transition may not be that I don't particularly practice yoga is because I spent a lot of time in those communities and places and spaces and the discussion of high vibe and high frequency and ignoring the grounding Yes, I is know. not helping. It's making things worse. And so we can talk about high vibe frequency and raising the resonance. But if you are not grounded, shit will not happen. Nothing will change. Yeah. It is just talk. It is just air. It is just energy. And we need and want to make manifest yeah. it needs to be tangible. Yes. So I that do. grounding is like epic. I know. I totally agree. It's gotten so bad for me. And I, I haven't said this publicly, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, there was a time it's less now because I'm so much more just, you know, within here, but there was a long period of time where people would come to me and say, oh, you need to go to this festival. It's, you know, it's all your kind of people, or you need to go, you need to live back out West and all this. And I would say, I can't, I, I don't, I detest that scene. Like it's way it's, and, and I don't want to say detest those people because I do not, but it's the conversation that is happening. And there's a split a lot of times, not all the time, even in the health food world, you know, it happens in the yoga world and the meditation world and the healing world and the spirituality world. I, I detest when I see this um, jargon going on and around and around and around and this way of having to be without actually the beingness of the way. And I just kind of, I've turned, you know, in solitude to myself and, and it's been Absolutely. A, a little bit of a lonely Same. road. In some it's ways. a very lonely road. It's very lonely. Yeah. Um, but I think when we get so lonely, we're probably getting really honest and really close to spirit, right? Yeah. Because all of those things that, that you share and, you know, we lived there for a long time and was totally in that place and space. It's also appropriated and commodified. Yeah. That is not spirit. That is not connection. And right. so when it gets so noisy and loud, which it is, mm -hmm. and I love the things that you said too. And I feel the same way of like, I'm not going to be witchy enough for some people. I'm super not witchy enough for some people. And I'm going to be way too woo woo and weird for most. Right. And it's like, we just have to be authentically ourselves. Yeah. We need to be having these conversations. We need to help rewrite the directive and pull it away from the commodification and the appropriation of it, right? People are looking for connection. They're yeah. looking for healing and yeah. they're needing grounding. Yes. They're just being fed too many noisy pieces. And that soul compass is like, it is like dusty. It needs to be cleaned off. Yeah. And, and, it's and spinning the, a million miles an hour. Where do I go? Where do I go? Where do I turn? Totally. You saying, this? You saying this, it's just out of control. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Well, one of the ways that I really um, am doing a lot more in-depth work personally is in my dream time. And one thing I've noticed, and I don't know why I'm thinking to share this right now, but uh, last night I turned off the 5G on my phone and I wanted to do it a long time ago, but I, I didn't. And then I saw somebody's post, which I was really grateful for, just the real simple instructions of how to do it. Because I live here mostly by myself and it's a big house. And so I keep my phone near me um, when I sleep. And I'm always, I've always been a very lucid dreamer. And I've in the past couple of years, intentionally bringing my healing work to my dream state, to the subconscious and really working through and processing things that way. I astral travel, you know, all that kind of stuff. But what I noticed last night is the quality of my sleep and my, I would just say the whole energy in the room was a little bit different by disengaging that 5G. And whether people think this is something, you know, I'm making up or not, I don't care. Maybe, it, maybe I am making it up. But do you have any um, input on not just the 5G, but how the, I know you, you keep saying noise, but how the increasingly overloaded electromagnetic field is yeah. affecting people. Yeah. I, I think that's the one that I'm very comfortable to speak to is the electromagnetic field that just mm -hmm. has been turned up, turned up, turned up and turned up. And we don't realize how loud and how noisy it is. You know, in our house, it's like a lot of discussion about screens and pixels. And we live in Brooklyn. It's very concrete. The last three years, 
you know, we haven't had a ton of outdoor time and it's like very noticeable in our house. Like I'm hypersensitive. I'm a psychic intuitive and frequency really matters. I also have the beautiful luck and serendipity of working with some people really early on that, um, we're working in places and spaces with no EMFs, right? Like to do body work, to do meditation, to do, and to this day, that feels like oxygen. Like if you just have two rooms, right. Of like, one that's gotten like no, no electricity, no wired lights, you know, no phones, no speakers, no, no nothing in there versus a room. Like to this day, I'm the hypersensitive in my house. And I'm like, we got We have to turn everything off. Right. Yeah. So taking your phone out of your bedroom is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, I just, my brain just, it has increased because we're living with smartphones in our pockets. We essentially have TVs in our hands. Yes. All, all the time. time. I know, you know, know, and it is addictive. It is challenging to separate because I am a huge advocate for technology, right? Aquarian age. Yeah. Like yeah. you want to be futuristic forward thinking. We're not going to ditch our technology, nor really should we. We just need to figure out that balance again, like humanity and divinity, mm-hmm. a balance between technology and our primal sacred self. The thing about the body, to bring it back to the body, our bodies, our vessels are primal. Mm -hmm. They haven't progressed. They actually can't channel that much frequency. Right. So like, even if we don't get into grand spectrum of it, this heightened anxiety, this heightened sense of like not being able to calm and ground and root. Yeah. Has just put your phone down. And that sounds so simple and it's not always. But it's, isn't it? it, Yeah. It's so ironic though. People feel, well, if I don't have that thing that I'm not connected. And the truth is if you don't have that thing, you'll be more connected. Right. And so again, the balance, like, again, we're not going to give up our technology, but how do we cultivate a balance of that? When do we set it down? My friends and community know that like, I'm a little backwards. Like I'm, I am going to still work in this, you know, schedule of uh, Western schedule of Monday through Friday. Cause that's what works right now. But Saturday and Sunday, I hardly answer my phone and I hardly post anything and everybody can just wait on me. I need to be present with my family. I need to be present with myself. Nice. And it, you know, we, these digital detox pieces, it just speaks so much to Western culture of like a quick fix. It's not about taking four days off. It's not about taking a month off. It's about how are you living your life in perpetuity and where are those off times within that? Mm -hmm. And I think the bedroom and sleep time, sleep dream time is so powerful. It's the ultimate healer along with our food. And if we have all these frequencies interfering during your sleep, like we have like in the apartment that we're in it, you know, it has lighting in it, but we didn't put any other lights in. We we don't sleep with TVs in the bedroom, never have. And like, I go through periods of time too, of just leaving the phone out mm-hmm. because it's very different, but mm-hmm. I'm also hypersensitive to it. Right. It's, yeah. it's distinctly different. It's very different. It reminds me, I um, recently had a healing session with a gentleman and the, and I was the one getting, receiving the body work and in his space, it's very disconnected from technology. And the second that we started, um, I noticed, I almost started crying because the familiarity of when I first started my healing practice back in 1993 or 94 in the healing center, there was no technology and the, just the, the resonant energy of freedom and space there it made me feel like I was going home and, and reminded me of my healing journey 30 years ago uh, when, when I was really at the crux of it. And it was one of the most, it sounds so subtle and so simple, but that remembering of what life is and what um, connection is, especially in the, in the scope of doing healing work was so powerful. So I really appreciate you conversing about this with us. Well, we have a lot of thought towards our children. They're digital natives, right? They've never known a world without it. And that's so crazy, right? And so we've, up until the last three years, and we made concerted efforts, but like to give them a connection to nature, right? Because their systems may not for a lot in this generation register a homeostasis set point of calm Mm -hmm. simply because the pixelated frequencies and the EMFs are, are triggering at all times. Yeah. And so, you know, there's just, 
so many layers that were that sound hard and loud and big and they are but they can also just be really basic yeah. and really calm right. like just how can we spend some time without that that's yeah. all remind the vessel and like you said i have a pisces moon i'm all the tears it is how i process mm -hmm. and when i've had weeks that are too busy and i didn't get those two quiet days the feeling that i have when i get on the mat in the work that i teach coming home to the body and the vessel mm -hmm. it's that it's that crying and, and I had a like hugely yesterday, it, it was just like this epic buildup of like, it had been really busy and like a lot to solve. And it, that's what the mat feels like to me. And yeah. so, you know, I teach what I needed, what resonates for me, but I wasn't finding in the world mm -hmm. and reminding people that you can find those quiet, calm, balanced spaces. Yes, in nature, of course. Yes, turning those alerts off on your phone and, and those settings. But also coming back to the vessel allows you to do that. Yes. Right? Yeah, it's so beautiful. Well, I know that you're interested in tarot. We don't have a lot of time left, but um, do you have your tarot deck nearby? I have many of them nearby. <laughs> I want you to pull me a card. Okay. And then I want you to tell us about that card and your love of tarot just briefly, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, do you switching have, gears. yeah, it's all about switching gears. Okay. Hold please. Cause I'm going to figure out which deck wants whichever. Yeah. Whatever one you feel. Okay. She's back. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. I just pulled out Kim Kranz's wild unknown deck. It tends to be my deck. Um, she's always a loud speaker. Um, do you have a particular inquiry? No, I'm just curious of what's showing up and just to see a little bit of your process. Do you, do you do tarot readings professionally or just through your unicorn? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, this is the channel. This is the this is it. This has been it since I was 16. Um, I, I will pull for the next best steps for your highest and greatest good. We want a, a channel. We want a direction to go. <laughs> uh, two of swords. So um, it's one of my favorite cards. I say that a lot <laughs> about a lot of cards and we're not supposed to have favorites, but I do. I think there's a few cards that if you ignored the rest of the deck, they would be very helpful if you just leaned into a few, and this is one of them. Um, swords is intellect, human thought process, and words. Um, but with me, really, it, it turns to subconscious programming um, because I feel like, you know, as a human and our cerebral processing, actually, that's what trips us up most of the time is what we think about things rather than tuning into what is the subconscious programming telling me? And we all have subconscious programming, right? We've grown up in a, and been reared in a toxic masculinity, patriarchal, racist culture that subconscious programming has got a chokehold on us. And so it often will feel like that's really what's driving the bus at all times. It takes a whole lot to get into that subconscious, to heal it, to let it out, to be earnest about what's rolling around in there to move forward. And so next best steps forward for your highest and greatest good is this two of swords. Two of swords is really about making a choice, right? And that sounds so simple, but I think the closer to spirit and closer on path you get, right? You can, you're like, oh, actually it didn't matter which direction I went do you know what I mean? Like you're going to end up in the right place. It just might be circuitous and long or kind of uncomfortable. The other path might've had snacks and like helpers along the way, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I need that one. Um, but we're going to get where we're supposed to be going no matter what, but it always says to go to meditation, right. To pick the path. And that the beauty here is that two things if we just pick a path, stick to the plan, like I made this choice and I'm heading down that direction, mm -hmm. right? For a period of time. But when you head towards meditation, you know, it takes out, we, we receive something like what, like 98% of our information visually when we, you know, have our vision with us. Right. And so you go to meditation and you take so much of this humanness, programming, fear, cerebral pro con list, you know, this has a five-star rating and then you can get into 
well, how do I feel about this? What do I think mm -hmm. about this? And so it's interesting because you already have such a, a consistent long practice of meditation, of, of filtering out, of closing off to make your choice, to pick your path, to walk your way. But next best steps forward for your highest and greatest good would be to dig a little bit deeper into the subconscious programming of things that would need to be released or rewired or at least brought into the light. Cause in this deck, there's an eclipse here, right? Yeah. You've got the moon going over the sun. So there is something in that subconscious that's eclipsing. That's kind of like a chink in the armor that you don't, it's a, your blind spot, so mm -hmm. to speak. And again, this is about digging into like, what is that blind spot of subconscious programming that's that could lighten up the path. Like it could bring the helpers in the snacks, you yeah. know, <laughs> to just recognize that it's there and i think that's the what's coming through as the next like i keep hearing brave work there's brave work in there mm -hmm. and um okay i mean if you asked so we opened the channel Go right for it. That um, there is the, some of this messaging of of appropriation and of commodification and of um yeah privilege in it, right? Like we all have to do this deconstructive work, but it's like hiding in these funky, tiny spaces mm -hmm. that if you go seeking it in meditation, it feels like it's going to be illuminated and let out in this way that, um, feels like a breath. It feels like that, like weird smoke that leaves, mm -hmm. but you're like, I didn't even know that was like a thing in my ribs. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tandy, for your insight, for your awareness and your dedication to your path, your healing, your journey, helping other people and all the work that you do. Um, Tandy's information will be in our show notes so you can find her website there. And I look forward to hearing more from you in the coming days and months and years along. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you.